In uh, 1998, when Professor Kevin Warwick implanted an RFID chip inside his arm to control electronic devices in his home, not only did he become arguably the world's first cyborg on record, but also opened up profound questions about the future of humanity. In today's world of artificial intelligence and advancements in chips and uh, neurobiology, these questions need to be urgently confronted. In today's podcast, we speak to Dr. Warwick about his pioneering experiments and explore this intriguing intersection of technology and humanity and what it means to be human. Dr. Kevin is a professor of cybernetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and biomedical engineering. I hope you enjoy this video and please consider subscribing to the channel, like, share, comment. Thank you. So hello and uh, welcome to the channel. Uh, we have today the legendary man himself, uh, the cyborg man as they call him, Professor Kevin Warwick, sir. A uh, warm welcome. How are you doing today? Just fine. It's raining in England, but uh, that's normal. Ah, okay. So it's not quite summer yet, because it's here no. it's really hot and balmy. No, it can very much the opposite, cold and wet and windy at the moment. So. Super glad that you're able to join us. I just wanted to quickly start off how does it feel? Because when people say cyborg, like what comes to most people's minds is, uh, you know, like what they portray in Hollywood, futuristic sci-fi Robocop uh, kind of a, like, a, like a figure uh, who is part human, part a robot. And how does it feel to be called a cyborg? Like, is that, is that a label you wear with pride or is that something that you hesitate to uh, carry? No, I don't mind at all. Um, I mean, when you look at what a cyborg means, the link between human and technology, some people include people who are riding a bicycle or wearing glasses, you, then you're a cyborg, which, you know, if that's what people want to say, fine. But for me, what a cyborg is, is as you've described, it's very much as science fiction has come up with, like the Terminator or, or Robocop, something like that. Um, so I, I'm more in tune with the science fiction version where you've got a human uh, integrated with technology or, or technology means you're part human, part machine. And, and that's really my concept. The science fiction concept is more what I right. feel is, is a cyborg. So I'm, I'm quite happy to be included in that sort of list. Right. So, of course, you, of course, refer to this broad definition of, you know, like a, like usage of a tool as the extension of an appendage. Of course, in that case, ever since we started using tools, I guess we would call people cyborgs. But then I guess in this case, people usually mean it as an electronic appendage, right? It's something that does, that's more than just a passive, uh, whose functions are more than what just the body imparts to it. And I think that's important when you say the functions are more... And I, I think that is important. That, that's how I would see it as well. You know, we, we're pretty limited in what we do as humans. We can do a lot as humans, but we're limited. When you, you think of how we sense the world around us, our vision right. is okay, but we, we miss a lot of what's going on. We, we don't sense in infrared or ultraviolet or x-rays, and so it goes on. There's an awful lot we miss out on. And part of my concept, my research, has been involved with trying to increase the senses. Um, certainly ultrasonics was, was the easier one to do. Infrared as well is not too difficult to do. And then the question is, okay, you, you can get signals coming in to the nervous system, in my case, in terms of ultrasonics. But then how does the brain take that? Is it easy for the brain to learn to recognize ultrasonic pulses and therefore use them in terms of some technological appendage or extra? So the whole concept of the cyborg having extra than a human, I think, is very important. Right. So so if we apply that kind of a definition, of course, going... Um... Uh, by the strict uh, technical meaning of a cyborg, you, of course, uh, I think, are the first ever cyborg that uh, 
people, I think, know, I guess, on record. Would that be correct to say? Would you would be the first I, cyborg? I think so. There are quite a few people who have a problem. There's a guy, Neil Harbison, who is colorblind. And to overcome the problem, then he's got a camera on his head and then colors from the camera are, are used to stimulate tapping uh, so he can understand different colors. But it's to overcome a problem that he's got. And right. I think many people who are different types of cyborg, if you like, with artificial legs and artificial arms, it's, that, it's to overcome a problem. Well, that's not what I was involved with in research. Mine was very much looking right. at extras. Uh, extending what humans could do, which I think is important. Right. And and you, of course, did it. Uh, I think your first experiment, if I'm not wrong, was in 1998, almost a quarter of a century ago, I guess. So yeah. you were very, you, you were quite literally a visionary back then because you were, maybe people were, it was not even a common topic back then. Well, uh, I mean, the, that all I had for the first one, as you say, a long time ago now, but all I had was an, an RF idea, a radio frequency identification device implanted, which was the important thing. And that identified me to the computer in my building. So as I moved around the building, doors opened for me and lights came on and uh, hello, Professor Warwick. It was, it was great fun. Um, but it was just showing what was possible. And at the time, it, it was pushing things technically, as it were. I mean, I, I was fortunate to be in a technological department where we had different pieces of technology that we could network the department. You, you really needed that. I mean, okay, you can have an implant and walk around in the building, but if it doesn't do anything, if it's not connected to an electronic network in some way, then, it, then there's no point. And so we were able to have a whole technological background but it meant that you had to be involved with a technological a company or a department or the, that was involved with that in order to get something out of it. So there weren't many people in a position that could do that at the time. It was really pushing the technology uh, as well as philosophy in terms of somebody having an implant that could do things or help them do things like that. Right. But so suppose like I could ask the question, what's the difference between implanting the chip under the skin versus in this case where you walk into a room and you're able to affect devices instead of just carrying a device in your pocket i mean you could have a personal device in your pocket uh, that is powered and connected to the devices and then when you walk in there are motion sensors and everything you could very well achieve the same thing today without having to put something in your body so yeah i, I, I mean i'm sure I, I think i get the point you're making it was more like a technology demonstration at that point but it was technology uh, demonstration, but I think also having it implanted was important because once you're in the body, then you start, that, you know, that's the next step to say, now I've got right. this it's in my body, it's not stuck on, anybody could do it stuck on the body or just in my um, shirt pocket or something like that. But the key point I felt, both technology wise and philosophically, was have actually having the thing implanted. So a doctor was involved with that as well, because once it's implanted, then it's OK. Well, now can we change the signals rather than just having an identifying signal, which is all it was um, that we used. So if we're right. in the body, we can have different signals from inside the body, potentially anything going S signals from movement, signals from um, fluid flow, temperature, all sorts of things you can send from inside your body, which now in the medical world, of course, they're doing different things like that. Um, but at the right. time, there wasn't anything like that. So it was really opening it up. And that led on to the second experiment, which was four years after that, that first one, where we did start to, we linked up to the, you know, we, we went several steps in a way, went past muscles and other signals and went straight to the the nervous system which is you know one off, one off the brain as it were right yeah so i i actually wanted to get into the little you know details of the second exp uh, the experiment that you did which i guess is uh, much more uh, interesting but before that uh, how did you get into this project like was it your idea did you did, were you inspired from somewhere how did this whole project cyborg uh, start in the first place yeah well, as I say, I was in a technological department and we realized that we had the technology that we could take that next okay. step. 
uh, part, you know, I, I had a, a friend who was a doctor as well, so I, I can bring him in on this. I, I actually went to him one day and showed him a an RFID chip or device that we were using, which was uh, two and a half centimeters long, about an inch long. And I said, can you implant this in, in my body? And uh, I think he was, I mean, this was just, he was just a regular GP, a regular doctor. And uh, so I think he was quite shocked, but being being a friend, we talked about it and he said, okay. And he started to do uh, a bit of research for himself to find out, okay, what what's the best way? If we want it to be sterilized, if we don't want to destroy it, what have we got to do? So it was working both with the from the technological side and including medical. But I think my inspiration, apart from having a technological background, um, came from a number of things. One was just interested in the science fiction that you were talking about earlier. And from the point of view, not just that it's science fiction, but from the point of view of could this be science fact rather than could we actually do things like that another thing was that inspired me when i was about eight or nine my father had agoraphobia which meant he was he was scared he couldn't go outside he was stuck in a, a room i mean it was it was bad he had to stop work and he, he really couldn't go out or anything like that which was really awful for him but they operated on him they they took him into the hospital he was kicking and screaming and sweating because they took him outside to get him to hospital and they operated on him neurologically as he described it they drilled a couple of holes in the top of his head and cut out some of his brain cells a, a leucotomy or lobotomy whichever you want to call it but the point was that it worked for him he, he i mean it was the dangerous operation but simply changing just a few brain cells, he was then, I mean, he, he was friendly with everybody. He was completely different after a few months. Um, so he, he could go out anywhere. He wasn't scared. Quite the opposite. He, he would go, you know, he would go to new countries or travel in new ways. Um, he wasn't bothered at all. Uh, so his fear of going outside was completely overcome by very, very relatively minor neurological operation and that opened up my mind wow if you can do that what else can you possibly do so partly my, my father and his medical requirements were inspirational as well to me getting involved in it to see what we can do and i know and i've been involved in other work with um parkinson disease implants and so on because of exactly that right. well that's very interesting uh, I guess now getting into the, the the second experiment itself, maybe if you could just take us quickly through uh, exactly what was achieved, because I, uh, if I remember correctly, you implanted a, ch a really small chip uh, into your wrist and you were able to... How do the, the contact points of a chip like that sort of work with the nerves? How do they know how to interface with the nervous system? Like, does it happen naturally? Or does the tissue have to grow once you implant it? Like, how does that work? Lots of, lots of questions there. I mean, that, to be honest, yeah. that was part of the part of the research was, was finding out, does it grow naturally? What happens? Does the, the body tend to try and reject it? Which is, the answer is no, it doesn't. Quite the opposite when it's into the nervous system. But what we have had used was a device called a brain gate, and that had 100 little spikes with electrodes on the end of them, the platinum electrodes. And that, w that was fired into the nervous system in my left arm. Right. I don't know if you can see the still scars from that now. Um, so what the surgeons had to do was to, first of all, cut away the, the sheath. There's like a covering around the nervous system. Um, which is the problem for people with multiple sclerosis, sclerosis that that covering um, doesn't work. It, it, it disappears. Is that the myelin no. sheath? The myelin sheath, exactly that. So the surgeons okay. had to cut that, cut away a section of that and then simply fired in the um, electrodes. They were about halfway into the nervous system, a couple of millimeters into the nervous system. Um, so, and, and each of the electrodes was simply about three micrometers in diameter. So we're talking 
mi micrometer scale, right. which nerve fibers, neurons, you know, typically 10 micrometers, 20 micrometers. It's that sort of size. So with, with that sort of size, you can get down to, in this case, individual nerve fibers, individual neurons, um, and get very high resolution of data. But it's very much, right. it was fired in. Um, what we found over time, rather than trying to reject the, the, the whole brain gate, it, it grew tissue around the, the, the device, pulling it in more closely. So it actually improved the connection over a period of time, which was very useful. Um, and the first thing we did, so I, I was, it was a two hour neurosurgical operation because it was the first time surgeons had ever implanted that in a human. I think it had been implanted in uh, chicken sciatic nerves before then. I'm not sure the chickens were alive when they did that either, but uh, it hadn't been implanted in a human before. So for the surgeons, it was a, a research project for them to actually do it. it took two hours. Um, things didn't go completely correctly. Um, we, even with firing the implant into my nervous system, they weren't sure how to do that to start with. And it was it was sucking instead of blowing and all, all sorts of things like that, which is not, not it wasn't a well-rehearsed uh, operation. Um, and I had to wait about 10 days so the surgeons were happy that everything was going all right from a medical point of view before I could start research. And one of the first things that we did on it was simply by me moving my hand, we could pick up neurological signals that were doing that, um, right. which my brain was sending out. And then we simply collected them and sent them out to a robot hand to, in order to get the robot hand to copy my hand movements. So the, the very first experiment we did was to um, get my brain signals as well as moving my hand which there they're doing that now they also the same signals were sent out to a robot hand so my hand was operating the robot hand but my brain if you like was directly operating the robot hand subsequently we I mean, this is where we get to the cyborg concept subsequently we did that with me in the united states in columbia university new york and the robot hand in england in reading university so essentially, I, I was moving my hand in New York and the robot hand was controlled by my brain signals in, in England. Eff effectively, my nervous system was linked to the Internet and it extended my nervous system across the Internet. And not only that, by that time when we did that, we had fingertip sensors on the robot hand and signals were sent back from England to New York to stimulate my nervous system. It, it took me several months to, to learn effectively to use the, the ultrasonic stimulating pulses. But for that experiment, uh, I was able to feel how much force the robot hand was applying on a different continent. So you right. can extend, you know, your brain can be in one place, your body can be in a completely different place or parts of your body. So, and what is your body can be what we consider normally to be your body, but it also can be a technology because your nervous system's controlling it and, and getting feedback from it. Right. I, I'd imagine the nerve endings in that specific spot where you place the, um, the, the chip how did you guys choose that spot and no, not anywhere else? Because I'd imagine when you when you choose, I mean, the nerve endings they control a, in the like so many different functions in the body. Was there ever a concern that maybe it could trigger something else that is connected to the heart or a vital function or somewhere in the brain? Maybe it can trigger like an avalanche of signals or something like this. Or well, was there a concern at all? It was just before it goes into the carpal tunnel. So the signals that it would would be picking up were to do with motor signals okay okay you know i don't think we meaning we humans understand fully the functioning of the nervous system so as you said there could be 
various feedback terms that maybe operate something else or mean something else to the brain. Um, but I don't think we worried about that, either ourselves or the surgeons. It was really dealing with motor signals, which were the, what, the main ones that we could pick up and try and make some sense of as far as uh, them controlling my hand and hence from a technological right. point of view out to the robot hand. Um, so I've included in that, it's one thing was remote control of the device, but also feedback and uh, effectively ex different sensory input. Um, first of all, on that latter point, I was, for the experiment, was wearing a blindfold so I couldn't see anything. And the researchers were moving different boards and different objects around in front of me. And I had ultrasonic sensors on a baseball cap. So the ultrasonic sensors, very much like a, a submarine works or a bat uses, were sending out pulses, ping, and dependent on how far away the, the object were, they'd get a... Like a, sonar. A, a, like sonar, exactly that. So so I, I had, I mean, the sensors were then connected to my nervous system directly. So I, I was getting pulses coming back from the sensors, and then the quicker they came, the closer the object was. That was fairly straightforward for my brain to understand how to use a sonar sense. So I did have a, a bat-like sense in that, in that, which was very effective. There was another one of those parts of the experiment that was successful. I think for me the most exciting part of the experiment um, was that my wife had electrodes pushed into her nervous system as well. And what we did was link our two nervous systems together electronically because we were looking for communication. Um, this was what we, we could do. So what happened when my wife closed her hand, pulses were sent from, from her nervous system across the internet and down into my nervous system. So my brain was getting pulses if my wife went dick dick dick, my brain got dick dick dick, got three pulses, um, and I was right. trying to make sure that I only got pulses when she was closing her hand. So we had a group of people that I I couldn't see what she was doing. A group of people were around her checking what she was doing, and a group of people were around me so she couldn't see what I was doing. So we were we were trying to communicate with each other in a very simplistic way, like a telegraphic way nervous system to nervous system which which was very successful we didn't but was this mediated uh, through the sorry was this mediated through the internet or were you in the same location or in completely different locations well a, a bit of both i mean it was by the internet but we had to be in the same roughly the same location i think she was in one room and i was in another room um so we couldn't right. actually see each other or hear each other directly but i could Son sonically, if you like, from and ultrasound, I could uh, sense how many pulses she was sending through. So, it, like a, a telegraphic communication, which, uh, in, in terms of a, a basic thing, it was a very simplistic thing, but it was something we could do. But leading on, right. once we get connections from brain to brain, of course, then it's the start of communicating by, by thoughts and all sorts of things. So, it opens up things for the future. But for us, it was technologically something we could do and very simplistic in that sense. Right. And uh, was it your wife's idea? Or did she volunteer or was it your idea to involve her? Or did it have consequences? <laughs> because I imagine she had to undergo the same same kind of surgery that you did. Well, first of all, she she had something that was a lot more painful, to be honest. The doctor doctor that was involved in my, my first experiment, he, he got involved and he pushed electrodes into her nervous system um, which and he, to make sure he'd, he'd got a good connection he couldn't use anaesthetic or anything like that. So for her it was a very painful experience and uh, how she described it, when I moved my hand, she felt it was, as she described it, it was like lightning moving up her finger that was her description she's not not a, oh, wow. a scientist at all um but she very much wanted to be involved with it um she was very i say cynical is that the right word 
because she questioned certainly the whole she she got from me regularly this is what the experiment we're doing and i don't think she could quite believe what we were trying to do so she wanted to get involved just to show that to herself right. if nothing else that this actually happens and actually works which it did so she believed from subsequently from there um, but it was a painful experience for her, which for me it wasn't really big, because it, we all did it much more slowly, as it were. I had a local anaesthetic when the surgeons put the implant in, and then when the anaesthetic wore off, it wasn't painful in that sense. It was just awkward, awkward that I had the the chip implanted for some time. It was, it was in place for just over three months, a hundred days exactly. Uh, and right. then it came out again, which was part of the experiment. We wanted to see what would happen to the electrodes, what would happen to the device, and so on. Uh, would it degrade, with, uh, you know, within the time period? Right. And did you guys make any interesting observations when you tried to, obviously, so after three months, it was surgically removed. Uh, were any learnings obtained from the fact that these, I guess, your nervous system had grown to sort of include this device in the body? Uh, I'm sure yeah, it must I be... Mean, that, that was, for, again, a learning curve for the surgeons because um, they thought initially, oh, this is just going to be a 10-minute job. We'll just open up and pull it out. And, and they couldn't. They had to cut away all the fibrous tissue. So you could see very clearly that it was held firmly in place. The body, I mean, it, it, it had put up what you could regard as defensive mechanism, the growing the fibrous tissue. But it's defensive mechanism, which, which tends to push things um, sort of out, of out of the physical body but into the mental body, in, into the brain, into the nervous system. It's the same with um, implants that go into the brain themselves. Um, it does the same sort right. of thing. So it, it pushes it out of the physical body, if I can call it that, but into uh, into nerves and uh, brain cells and so on and so forth. It sort of works, it works in a positive way for this type of uh, surgery and so on. And what was the composition of this uh, chip? Because you said the body didn't reject it. Did it require some special coating or was it just silicon, copper wires or whatever? Plat platinum is the main, platinum and iridium, um, as far as I'm aware anyway. But right. uh, yeah, I mean, that. I, I think for for most electrodes and that sort of rejection isn't a problem in most. It's been fairly well researched uh, and is a good part of the, the whole field. Right. And once it came out, how did you feel? Was there, a, was there a difference? Because had your had your nervous system, I'm sure it would have gotten used to the presence of this uh, device and interfacing with it. Did it feel like a part of you had come off or was it uh, like a foreign body is being removed? Uh, you know, like I was there, a, was there a, a... A bit of both, to be honest. Um, I, I purposefully had done it as an experiment so it wasn't as though I was living with it as part of everyday life I mean that that would be an interesting experiment in itself but when I was in the laboratory so we were doing experiments with it and when I left the laboratory okay it was still implanted but um, you know I wasn't actually physically using it at all so I don't think I, I it would be nice to say oh it was terrible living without it I, I think, the, in fact, the first device, the, the identification device, because when I walked into the building, whenever I walked into the building, it said hello and open doors. and the, So that was more difficult to live with um, in and around the building. Suddenly I'd walk towards the door and it wouldn't open for me automatically. Right. So, but, but this one, uh, because it was a... You know, it was a scientific experiment, and because of that, um, when it when the thing came out, it was more of interest. I I think the overriding thing, as a team, we had a, a close team of about five of us all together, been doing, we'd been working on it without stop. We we didn't have any break, at all, at all. So every day we were working on it from a scientific point of view, doing different experiments. We do some experiments for one week. And we'd also be planning what experiments are we doing next week. It was a constant thing. And uh, when the implant came out, 
we were absolutely shattered we were just exhausted from um you know working constantly on it day after day so i think what there was was a oh, just let's let's have a bit of a breather let's have a break from it right rather than anything else to uh, this me being honest about the whole thing right and and are where uh, are these reports uh, and the details of the experiments public is it available for someone like are there videos and you know uh, reports filed at the end of the experiment the findings is that uh, publicly freely available somewhere is that people can yeah, look up or is it freely i think freely well but there's lots of academic papers i i know well aware of that some are free so some are not um right. i published a book in england i cyborg which gave a a chatty version of everything and a behind the scenes because actually getting some experiment like that to happen is not the easiest thing in the world all sorts of people are finding reasons why you can't do such an experiment uh, people from insurance you know this was within a university so the university had to be happy that everything was all right that in itself was not easy to do um so i in the book i was giving more of a, a background and a, a concept of general concept of what we we're trying to do but technologically i think if you go on google scholar um then you'd be able to link with my name you find a whole series of relevant uh, papers uh i mean i'm happy to send people papers if necessary but i'm i'm sure there's quite a few online that they'd be able to find i mean we did we did have some problem i can remember with, with getting papers published it's not that easy uh, in some ways not from a technological point of view but the, i mean for example who wrote one paper which we were looking at extending the sensory sensory input to humans like i was saying about ultrasonics and i think the paper was entitled extending the human sensory input and it was quite clear that the editor of what was a scientific journal i won't give the name of the journal but it's very you know internationally recognized and very prestigious journal um it was quite clear that the editor of the journal was very religious in his uh, background and the fact that this was talking about adding sensory input and the humans having limited senses and so on um he took offense to quite strongly and the the paper didn't get any further than that the editor just woof no you can't which wow. i i was quite amazed uh, when that all happened i mean the paper did get subsequently published and appeared and and so on uh, find it find it somewhere there but i am amazed that in the scientific world you could have things like that so and and did this have uh, any health consequences at all for you or your wife in the long term in terms of i'm sure you were measuring uh, like biomarkers in the blood and you know uh, did it did it affect any of these uh, uh, values or did you guys check that at all um no we've been checked out a number of times since then and no problem no problem in that sense no we have have right. to say and we're still happily married i think it, it, it i you know the whole doing the experiment together i can strongly recommend work work with your spouse at some time it uh, <laughs> it, it was nice working together on it and it gave us a shared experience which we're um, very happy with right. i have to say and I, I have to say it, it's not when you're doing a scientific experiment you have a whole bunch of ideas that you've got and plans and we we had written the, we're going to try this experiment this experiment and so on but in some ex parts of the experiment I, i'm more we didn't just didn't have the time to do it so um we we did try and link we put electrodes on the outside of my brain and we tried to link the signals from my brain externally with the signals we pick we're picking up from the nervous system which you could see you know by visually you could say if i did that here's the the neurological signals so we can get some concept from the neurons the nerve fibers that we've got as to how they were associated with with movement um which to control the robot hand we didn't need it exactly um but but to to have it roughly correct to do that but linking with the signals externally and 
with those in the nerve fibers, that was something that we didn't really get any good results on. So to to right. say it was a complete and utter success would be, um, I mean, it was, but that didn't mean that there weren't things that we were wanting to do that didn't perhaps um, come to fruition. Right. And how would a, how would a, just a quick one more technical question, how would a chip or a device that you implant in the body be powered? Would it be self-powered? Was there like a mini battery? How does a... The... Yeah, that's a very, very Go good ahead. question. It's an important question. I think ultimately it'd have to be powered. Well, for the moment, you have to get some power device that, that can store power that is, is in the body. I mean, surgeons don't like to have wires coming in and out of the body. Uh, if it can be possibly avoided. And the surgeon certainly wanted initially to implant everything in my body. Um, and when, by the time we started doing the the whole experiment with the, the surgeons we were working with, we tried to construct something that actually had a battery, quite a, a big device to power, it, you know, it needed quite, a, a, quite a, a, an amount of electric power uh and th and this, this is what the surgeon asked was how how big is is your device if i'm going to implant it if it's the size of a cigarette packet there's no way i'm going to implant a cigarette packet if it's the size of a cigarette lighter then i can potentially implant it but there was no way we could get it at that time to be down to the size so i i had to have wires coming out of my body. So I had the implant was actually in my nervous system up here, close right. to the wrist, partly because the nervous system um, comes, because when it's going through the carpal tunnel, it comes up nearer to the surface of the skin. So it's easier for the surgeons to put the implant in somewhere there. Uh, but then I had wires running under my skin of my arm and it did more difficult to see but they came out here and i had a a gauntlet arrangement with a battery in it and an antenna which the antenna was used to transmit signals back and forth wirelessly um back and forth to the laptop and hence onto the internet so there was the two aspects one was the power source which we had to for the experiment had to you have externally and also an antenna, which we, for the experiment, had to have externally. But for the experiment, that was fine. But if you were providing a device that someone was going to walk around with, you'd have to integrate all that in and have it all implanted, I would suspect. Right. And obviously, this is all done a long time ago, and I'm sure technology has improved, both in terms of chips. Chips have become smaller and... Um, of course, the knowledge of neurology has improved, so we have, I think, a better idea of what part of the brain and what nerves control what. So I can only imagine if somebody were to do it today with more planning and with, with more knowledge of what's what, you could potentially sort of, like right now, human beings are sort of restricted to a very narrow uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum, a narrow region of, uh, you know, like obviously... At any given moment, there are like so many signals impinging on our system, which we are only consciously aware of a little bit, like a very narrow, uh, um, like a sure. zone. But yeah. if we could somehow capture impulses from other uh, regions of the spectrum, visual or even sound, ultra and um, over. So we could literally widen our, our range of perception as human beings. And we could do, I think somewhere it was mentioned uh, in your paper or somewhere, the technological technology-assisted telepathy or clairvoyance almost. Oh, yeah, I think certainly telepathy, I, I don't see any problem. I mean, it'd be fantastic in years to come with people experimenting with that and learning how to send signals brain to brain and so on. Um, but also, I think... I mean, you, you, there are differences between artificial intelligence, computer-based artificial intelligence, and human intelligence, how the human brain works. One of them is understanding different dimensions. Our brains really work, and we understand up, up to three dimensions. We then have problems, and maybe you include time as an extra dimension, but if you have a hundred-dimensional problem, 
we just simply can't get to grips with that. Whereas, of course, computers, even fairly basic ones, can deal with the, they're not limited in terms of dimensions. And I believe, I believe anyway, that uh, if we want to travel further in terms of space, we probably are going to have to do it in, in more dimensions than we deal with. It's dealing with 3D, we're pretty stuck. We we get to the edge of our solar system, and that's going to take several years. If we're going to travel longer distance through space, the sort of Star Trek and how it's been envisioned in science fiction, I think we're going to have to understand things in more dimensions. And that will involve connecting... Oh, one, one thing, one way we could do that is to link our brains up to computers and start understanding things in more dimensions. And hopefully that will give us the capability to travel through space long distances without, you know, having several generations in being born on a spaceship, which is sort of practically not realistic for the moment anyway. Right. And what's the current status of uh, Project Cyborg? Are you still involved in uh, some of these experiments or uh, have you taken a little break from... Uh implanting stuff into your body or other people's bodies well i, I think it's about time somebody else got when i when i hear what elon musk is doing um it's fantastic to hear the the research the projects and so so much connected with what we did in the past but you know i would put a challenge here now with with you elon musk you know have a go yourself you've not actually had implants yet so um connect your brain up to the technology you're talking about and, and find out for yourself how it works. So I, I, it would be nice if others did involve themselves in the science. Um, partly the, the papers I talked of before, you know, they need a few more citations. They, they've got a few, but they could do with a few more. So it needs other scientists to do research projects and find out related results um, to compare them with mine and say what Kevin Warwick did, either I hope they would say, yes, it, it was very good and he did this, that and the other, and our results concur with his, or they might say, but we found his results were not so good on this and that and the other, but they'll still cite my paper in doing so. So from a scientific point of view, I want other researchers to research in the field, which uh, right. maybe because of the dangers involved, I don't know, has, has not been as much as I would have imagined. Right, right. So I, I want to touch upon that point, the, uh, the whole concept of transhumanism, the philosophical ethical considerations quickly as we finish a little later. But I want to quickly jump on to uh, AI, which is, of course, all the rage these days. Now, I know that you were one of the early scientists working on uh, AI. I know you have a, you wrote a book on what is artificial intelligence, which is mostly technical and meant for like, I think, college and engineering students. And I did see that you had classified AI into sort of a classical AI or early AI and a modern AI in terms of uh, the era and the capabilities and what they do. Do you see, like right now, AI is all about chat GPT and Claude and large language models. Was that the same kind of research that you were doing back then? Or was it, is it completely, has it taken a complete different turn? No, I think it, it's interesting. AI has moved on enormously over the last two, even three or four years, never mind 10, 20 years. And one thing that I, I have been involved with, something called the Turing test, which is trying to get a um, compare machines, AI, how it communicates. And if you communicate with it, can you tell it's definitely a machine or it, it, you can't tell the difference because it can communicate so well? Well, now things like chat GPT, in a, in a different way, but are able to communicate in a way that you, you simply can't tell the difference. You don't know whether you're communicating with a human or a machine. Um, and obviously a number of reasons for that. The specifically chat GPT, I think the name gives it away, is related more to communication, to conversation rather than anything else. But... Uh, behind that is a type of AI that, that has moved on beyond the bounds that I thought was going to be possible at this time, which opens up a lot of positives 
that we can get AI to learn things for us. And like I, I'm talking about in terms of many dimensions that the machine can understand the differences of the dimensions or relationships and can give us information in the medical world where you've got a complex multidimensional system, which is the human body that, that will help us to treat people in a medical way both neurologically and, and generally, physiologically as well. Um, so there's lots of advantages for AI, uh, why we can improve, why we can make more money out of it because it understands the systems in different ways and so on and so forth. But how much control or power we give the AI, and this, this is where um, we have to be a little wary, that if, if the AI is allowed to understand the system in a way we can't and then make decisions which affect what's happening in the system we have to be wary maybe in a medical scenario it does it all itself you you know you you as a person put your body up on the lab table and the ai system can learn parameters to do with your body and will carry out treatment automatically because the system knows best, because the AI knows best. And how much we use such systems is that we really have to be wary of. Um, in a military scenario, does the AI system deal with making a decision about what's going on and then fire a missile itself automatically? So, here, And I think we, we occasionally see issues like that where that happens and that no body, no person is to blame for it. Well, somebody is always to blame for it. As soon as nobody is to blame, the machine is to blame for it, we're really getting into trouble. So I, I think we really have to be wary as to how much, it's as much how much control is given to an AI, how much power is given to an AI system, not only to do the analysis, which could be a great help for humans, but also then to enact or carry out some particular action automatically without a human being involved. Um, in certain circumstances, right. that can be very dangerous for humans. Do you think that artificial general intelligence is a possibility and it, it's imminent somehow? Oh, I think AGI, artificial general intelligence, is, is certainly a possibility. What we mean by that uh, is a question whether it means something that replicates how human does something and the, how the human brain works. Um, I, I, not necessarily, but I'm, I'm because it's different. The machine maybe does not have the same sensory input. Maybe it has different senses. The machine maybe does not have the the human body to function exactly as it would. So. Um, it, it is, is a form of AGI which can deal with sensory input, can react, can do things, but it doesn't necessarily have to do it in exactly the same way that a human does. If you want it to replicate a human completely, then you're talking about something that can replicate the human brain and could potentially model and replace right. a human brain. I guess we could get right. to that, but uh, and I, in terms of size and numbers of brain cells and capabilities like that, it will happen at some time. But uh, I don't know why you would want to, it, it, reasoning for it, when, when it can do things better, why limit it to have to behave like a human brain does, when the advantages we get from it are the, the fact that it does things in ways that a human brain can't do. Right. That's that's a very interesting point because I do know that there are companies like NVIDIA, for example, are working on advanced chips which are more um, specially prepared for uh, calculations needed in uh, uh, AI and machine learning. And I'm, 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 I'm guessing that at some point in the future, in a few years, you'll fi get these really small, energy-efficient, low-power chips which are capable of uh, a lot more tasks with AI features involved. And yes. if you just think of uh, where a convergence point between AI and uh, technology and, you know, uh, chip technology, neurobiology and, and, and cyborgs, you know, of the future, I can only imagine how 
one of course the obvious um, the benefit of for people who have loss of function to help them process their in their brain maybe you could produce put an artificial intelligence chip i don't know or or even to just enhance capabilities to form super soldiers or super performing corporate slaves which is a dystopian kind of a thing but like all these kind of things possibilities open up so and then we have to talk about the ethical implications of transhumanism which i want to come to as my last point for today well, what do you I, think I, of all this I because it's you're you're exactly right there's a whole plethora of different versions you know almost replacing human brains or, or not only just dealing with the problems with human brains which which i think is already happening certainly the the work i've been involved with with parkinson disease implants when you're recording the signals in the person's brain you can do it in real time uh, when when electrodes are in the brain but you don't have to actually do the recordings in the same place so I mean, effectively, what you can have, effectively, is that the person's part of the person's brain can actually be in a completely different place, could be in a different town, um, which can be difficult for people to conceive that you've got part, a technological part of your brain. This is this is now I'm talking about. This is not the future. This is now. But you've got a technological part of the brain for medical purposes that exists in a different place altogether to where the person is. But if it helps the person, great. But that's, that's what you've got now. So how, how you were talking there is, is certainly going to happen in the future. Um, and, uh, types of AGI that will be beyond anything we can imagine at the present time. Um, and we just got to hope that they're used for good rather than some sort of Terminator scenario is, is actually brought about for real rather than in a film version. Right. And at what point do you think we cease to be human? I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with this whole concept of uh, ship of Theseus. This, uh, I'm not sure if it's Greek or there's a philosopher who spoke of a ship, a brand new ship, uh, call it, maybe give it a name. And then over a period of years, you slowly replace each one of its part that's wearing down. And at some point, 95% of its parts have been replaced. Now, is it still the same ship? So I, I if you think... keep replacing parts of the body of a human being with chips and you know prosthetics and so, you know all these things, and let's say after five years, I'm mostly machine with just my brain and consciousness, maybe even just consciousness in the body, embodied in the machine. Am I human? Like all these philosophical questions come up. But I, but I think they're appropriate. They're not just philosophical questions. They're very practical questions, realistically. Oh, well, but philo philosophy can be practical, I guess. Um, I think as a cyborg, how we're looking now is you've got a, a few small elements. The, the, the implant I had was just a small element giving me an extra sense and so on, different things like that. Um, which, was I human? Uh, well, 99.99%, yes, I was human, but I, 0 0.001 or some per small percentage was not a human sensory input. So clearly the, the the whole understanding belief mechanisms and things like that of the human that becomes a cyborg uh, extends. It is not just human understanding. And as, as you take that further, exactly the philosophy you were talking about, where you're looking at extending that, you become a new creature, a new um, being, the, your understanding and belief of what you are and what others are is is um, is going to change. So if if you become then ninety nine point nine percent machine, and what was a part of the human, then your feelings and philosophy and beliefs will be that will be very different to what they are as humans, um, and you're in potentially the land of nature if we're talking philosophy and superhumans and, and that sort of scenario as well, where the, your capabilities are much greater than they were as as a human. And the whole question then is, how do you feel about humans? Do you still treat them in a, an equal way? Or do you think they're well, they're well inferior to you because they can't do this, 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 this and this, and therefore should I give them equal rights and so on and so forth? So 
you're opening up right. that sort of philosophy, but in a realistic scientific scenario. Um, right. But that that's how it is. Well, it's it's really fascinating. A quarter of a century ago, when you when you started these experiments, did you even imagine that in your lifetime we would be in a position where this would be a real possibility, and we have to confront these difficult questions? I mean, where do you think humanity is headed? Like, do you think you have hope, and it's gonna we're gonna be in control, or is it like machines taking over soon? Um, well, I. I... I'm schizophrenic in that sense. I've got to. <laughs> I hope, I hope that it is something that humans are in control and we use the technology from medical purposes, which we're seeing. There's so many examples where, from a medical point of view, people, we understand problems in a much deeper, much more profound way and will continue to do so, particularly on the neurological side. We've got so much more to learn about how the brain, how, even how the nervous system works. There's so much we, we still need to learn. And I hope we can use it, AI particularly, to help with that and implants for, the, for, for that. But we have to watch you know, how much we allow it to make the decisions, uh, how much we allow artificial intelligence to call the shots. Um, it, it may become a being in itself an entity that doesn't much like humans because we try and switch it off which it doesn't want it to do right. want us to do so uh, we, we have to be very wary of the not not poo poo it not say all oh, this this can't possibly happen it, we have to be realistic it can possibly happen that we get into dangers like that because people will go more to the edge. I've got an AI, it'd be better if I just let it go rather than trying to control it all the time and do exactly what I want because I know that when I want things, it slows it down. It doesn't give it that ability to do that little bit extra. So right. that will always be the temptation to go that bit too far. Right. Yeah, so on that note, I think uh, we have to stop our chat for today. And uh, Professor Kevin, thank you so much. It was a fascinating chat. Uh, truly totally appreciate you, uh, you joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to talk with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.